Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, please let us know where you're tuning in from and what brought you here today. Um, we're going to wait for people to come in. Yeah, steadily seeing these numbers rising, um, but we still have a little bit ways to go. So as you're coming in, let us know where you're tuning in from. Um, I know we have a lot of people from Connecticut, but I'm sure there are lots of other folks uh, from the region, uh, from across the country, uh, maybe even from other parts of the world. So let us know, let us know where you're coming from. Um, looks like we have someone from Potomac, uh, down in the DC area. If anyone else wants to share where they're coming from, um, I'm here in the Hartford area. Um, X in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. We have Seattle, some representation from the other coast. Um, yeah, and we're still waiting for a few more people. And if you haven't had a chance to buy Peniel's book, we will be uh, putting links in the chat. Um, looks like some we have someone from right next door in Bloomfield in Hamden. Uh, so yeah, we'll be putting in a link for for the book, and if you uh, you can get it right through our museum store, which which is awesome because it'll help our museum. Um, and of course, you're gonna read a really amazing book. Um, so you know what? We'll go ahead and get started. I'll do I'll do my introduction here. Um, Hi, um, if you haven't tuned in before, um, I'm Omar Acevedo and I'm the literary program coordinator at the Mark Twain House and Museum here in Hartford, Connecticut. And I'm delighted to host tonight's program, Third Reconstruction, America's Struggle for Racial Justice in the 21st Century. Um, our virtual programs are produced in part with support honoring the late Frank Lord. We are happy to honor his memory with these programs. We are also incredibly grateful to the Wish You Well Foundation and Connecticut Public WNPR for supporting all of our all of our virtual programs. Now, let me tell you more about tonight's program. We are welcoming Peniel E. Joseph for a discussion with Elizabeth Herbin Triant, uh, Triant about his book, The Third Reconstruction. In this book, uh, Peniel draws connections and insights across centuries from America's first two. Uh, first and second reconstructions um, to uh, the third reconstruction that we're having in our current age. Now, our author, Peniel Joseph, is, a, is the Barbara Jordan Chair in Ethics and Political Values, the founding director of the, of the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy, and Associate Dean for Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at the LBJ School of Public Affairs and also the professor of history at the University of Texas at Austin. He is the author of award-winning books on African-American history, including The Sword and the Shield and Stokely Alive. They're really amazing books. If you haven't read them, uh, pick them up uh, with, along with The Third Reconstruction. Um, our moderator, Elizabeth Herbin Triant, is an associate professor of Black Studies and History at Amherst College and a current fellow at the Harvard Radcliffe Institute. Uh, she is also the author of Threatening Property, Race, Class, and Campaigns to Legislate Jim Crow Neighborhoods. We encourage you to have a conversation in the chat. If you have a specific question, you can post that directly into our Q&A section. Please also know that you can click on live transcript at the bottom of the screen to see live auto captioning of this event. Um, and as I said, I'll be putting in a link to the book in the chat uh, so you can get it through our museum store. Um, so that is all from me. Please sit back and enjoy this uh, awesome conversation, I'm sure. Um, and I'll turn this over to you, Peniel and Elizabeth. Well, thank you so much, Omar, for the introduction. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, it's a really wonderful book, Peniel, and I'm so glad to have the opportunity to discuss it with you. 
Um, so I'll just start by saying one thing that I love about this book is that it shows that Black Lives Matter has a history, that it's connected to earlier movements to make rights more broadly available and to protect the lives of Black people. For example, it points to similarities between BLM and the Black Panther Party's program. And yeah. so often I've found people don't see that BLM is the latest iteration of the Black freedom struggle. It's a movement that's been at work for generations. So thank you for, for writing this. And I guess I'll just start by asking you to tell us what inspired you to write this book and, and to summarize for us the argument that you make in the book. Well, thank you so much, Betsy, for the kind words. Um, you know, I was inspired by my mother and so many different um, women in my life who who um, have mentored me uh, really from, from birth to, to the present. So uh, in a lot of ways, um, the book is part memoir. You know, I'm the proud son of Haitian immigrants who came to the United States in 1965. I was raised by a single Black um, woman, uh, Jermaine Joseph, who's 83 and who um, has been my biggest teacher and uh, was, uh, you know, part of a labor union, SEIU 1199, grew up in New York City and Brooklyn and Queens, uh, was on my first picket line outside of Mount Sinai Hospital <laughs> um, over 40 years ago. So in a lot of ways, I um, come to the study of Black history through sort of the practical experience of having grown up in segregated New York City during the Ed Koch years, graffiti, racial profiling, um, poverty, a lot of a lot of racial and state sanctioned violence. But the thing is, Betsy, they kept telling us um, we had won, we had overcome <laughs> the civil rights movement had 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 worked. And uh, the the Catholic school I went to, St. Joe Fernand, and I recount it in the book, um, uh, by the time I was in junior high, I could see that the school had gone from being all white classrooms that had no black students to becoming racially integrated by around 1968-69 to within less than 10 years becoming all black and and just you know the product of white flight which you write about and you know you know it's it's just so interesting and so in a lot of ways the book was make was helping me to come to terms with both you know how I grew up uh in the post civil rights period um the period of 2008 to the present but also um, the, the, the period of reconstruction. So the book makes an argument that there are the, these three periods of reconstruction, and it really centers, um, yes, Black Lives Matter, but it centers, you know, Angela Davis, Ida B. Wells, and, you know, Stacey Abrams, and, you know, Alicia Garza, and, and you know, Kathy Cohen, and Beth Ritchie, and Audre Lorde, and so many other Black women as these co-architects of, of American democracy. And um, it argues that we're in a third period of reconstruction where we see these different juxtapositions between uh, a reconstructionist narrative of American democracy versus a redemptionist narrative of American democracy. And it continues really right up into the present. Texas, the state I'm in, has, is introducing a law to ban the teaching of DEI in, in higher ed, right, the Texas State Ledge. Um, and it's the same day uh, Claudine Gay is announced as the first Black president of Harvard, who's Black woman who's Haitian like I am. So it, it's these extraordinary juxtapositions. And historically, if you don't understand the history, you're going to say, well, how can we have uh, Justice Jackson as the first Black woman on the Supreme Court and voter suppression? Um, how can we have um, the first vice president who's a Black woman, Kamala Harris, and critical race theory the critical race theory hoax and the assault against the 1619 project, right? Um, but we've been here before, and I would I argue in the book that we have to go back to that first period of reconstruction from 1865 to 1898 to really see these founding um, foundational juxtapositions to understand why we can have both Black Lives Matter demonstrations and January 6th, right? How you can have Barack Obama and Donald Trump. Um, but also how you can have um, folks who've been pushing for abolition democracy and the abolition of policing and the abolition of punishment um, and state sanctioned violence and terror all at the same time. Um, so that's like the point of the book. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, can you tell us more about why you call this racial reckoning a reconstruction? 
um, what does the third reconstruction have in common with these earlier reconstructions? Well, you know, this idea of reconstruction is really important, um, Betsy. And one of the things I argue is that from 1865 to the present, everybody in this country is locked in a narrative war between folks who are uh, reconstructionist supporters of multiracial democracy. Um, at the radical edges of that are, are intersectional justice, and we can talk about what that means, um, versus folks who are um, advocates of the lost cause and advocates of white supremacy uh, who are redemptionist. And the Redeemer South, it's both centered on white supremacy, but it's bigger than white supremacy. What I mean by that is that the lost cause allows for people who are committing great acts of evil to think of themselves as good people. Um, people who are committing great acts of evil, both in their era and our own era, uh, to think that they're being, the acts of evil are being sanctioned by God um, himself, because God is always a he, that's the always. Um, so, and straight, he's definitely straight. Definitely. Um, they're certain of it. Um, so when we think about the, 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 the period of Reconstruction, I think Reconstruction is the period that gives us what Du Bois called abolition democracy. And activists like Ida B. Wells, Angela Davis, and BLM have really expanded what we mean by abolition democracy to mean that all Black lives matter and we have to eradicate all systems of punishment, however well meaning, you know, because all the systems of punishment we create to constrain and contain and marginalize and lead people to premature death, they are always founded in um, ideas or rhetorics of freedom and rhetorics of safety and rhetorics of liberation. Uh, and they always make us less free and less safe and less liberated. Um, and I think that um, the reconstruction period is so important because it shines a light on um, the problems uh, of American exceptionalism, which we can get deeper into. And so I think from 2008 to the present, we definitely have been in this moment of reconstruction from the election of Barack Obama in 08 to the rise of BLM 1.0 in 2013, uh, MAGA and Trump in 2016. But then 2020 has been really, and since 2020, we see the rise of BLM 2.0, the largest mass uh, protest in urban and rural uh, and suburban rebellions in American history, 25 million people out in the streets. Uh, we've seen um, the racial disparities of the pandemic. Uh, we've seen uh, the most racist presidential election in history, but also the one that had the most democratic participation. And we saw sort of 80, 81, 82 million to 74 million uh, vote for this reconstructionist uh, perspective. We see even the day before the January 6th white supremacist riot at the US Capitol, um, we see uh, Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff really sort of fulfill certain aspects of the dreams of, of radical reconstruction and support for multiracial democracy. But we also just saw it in the streets and all the demonstrations and so much uh, black, um, not just anger or rage, but so much black um, joy and catharsis uh, was in the air. People were playing music. People restored and refashioned uh, parks and did um, um, art uh, and dancing, uh, you know, through the summer of 2020 into the fall. And so I just think of that period as a period of profound reconstruction. I think everything that the Biden administration has accomplished has been connected to um, the BLM upsurge of 2020. So when sometimes people say, well, what are the policy impacts. The policy impacts are everything we've seen at the federal level from an administration that would not have been elected without not just Black people, but without this Black uh, uh, movement, right, this social protest movement. So that's why I call it Reconstruction. And I also think that there's the same backlash we witnessed during these earlier two periods of Reconstruction we're witnessing uh, now. We could see it with critical race theory. We could see it with the idea of a, of a Black-led crime wave, uh, we could see it in voter suppression. Um, and these are the same tools that were used 150 years ago. So what's extraordinary is that the script uh, continues. You know, um, um, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's a variation on a very old model. 
You know, so DeSantis and Trump uh, and the folks who are here in Texas, Abbott and others, uh, there are variations on a theme of, um, of, of Confederates. You know, these are, these are modern day Confederates and the Confederacy was this treasonous uh, crime against humanity, black humanity, but against the idea of America. Uh, and instead of being um, incarcerated, because uh, we talk about us as a law and order state, and instead of some of those folks being executed, they became senators and governors and plantation owners, including we had to face James Eastland in the 1950s and 60s and John Stennis. These are all people, uh, Betsy, who their family lineage went back to the Confederacy in Mississippi. Uh, they should not have been in charge of Mississippi when our ancestors were growing up in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. So what, what's happened to us in this country is, is a great series of crimes, but just like during the 1860s and 1870s and 1880s, it's filled with juxtapositions. Because as you know, I can show you Black communities in 1868 and 1878 that are thriving with people, as you know, Betsy, smarter than we will ever be, much more creative. Because how are we going to say we're going to be smarter than Ida B. Wells and Anna Julia Cooper and, 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 and Frederick Douglass? We're not. That's the answer. The answer is you're not, right? And so those people existed amidst those massacres in Hamburg, South Carolina, amidst the massacres in Wilmington, North Carolina, amidst the massacres in Memphis and New Orleans in 1866, right? Um, and they 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 were trying to bring democracy to the United States, multiracial democracy, but they were really stymied by white violence, both at the grassroots level, but also at the federal, the civic, the religious, uh, the social, the political, the legal level too. And we are facing um, some of those same storms right now. Um. Well, I wonder if we could talk a bit about the memoir aspect of the book. Um, so you weave in stories from your own life, and I wonder how framing this story about Reconstruction from your own personal perspective affects how readers will experience the story. Well, you know, I hope it makes it more accessible, you know, so it's not just history to me. Um, I think uh, I weave my own narrative in there because I think one of the things that as the, the older I get, um, I, I see it just turned uh, 50 in October. And so I've been doing this for, for what seems like a long time <laughs> um, um, because of my history is that, you know, we're storytellers. You know, we start out saying we want to be scholars, we want to do this and that, um, but we're really just telling stories and we're students, you know, so we start off saying we want to teach, we want to be experts and stuff, but uh, uh, you know, the, the experience and time gives you um, humility through pain and experience. So I wanted to share my own story. And the more I think about history now, uh, you know, I agree with uh, uh, Baldwin and others who, who, who talk about the past as being something that uh, is constantly being created uh, based on stories we tell each other. So I wanted to um, place my own story uh, within the context of the unfolding American story and African American story, and show why uh, why it mattered to me, because I think that, uh, and for those of us who are parents, and you know this, we're sharing a story with our children of how they were born, and how perhaps um, you and your spouse or significant other, or how how they came into the world. And that story is incredibly important. And that becomes their blueprint until they start meeting other people's stories and they start learning about the larger story of their neighborhood, of the city, of the state, of the country, of the nation, of the world, the communities they're part of. And, and I wanted to show and share how, you know, my story intertwined with, um, uh, you know, the stories of, you know, Spike Lee and, and seeing Do the Right Thing and the story of, seeing eyes on the prize in high school and in junior high, uh, of meeting Barack Obama before he became president, um, of, of being mentored by people like Sonia Sanchez and, and Femi Vaughn and, and others. And, and it's, it's, I think it's incredibly important for us to understand why these stories matter. And I wanted to connect those stories to the larger stories of reconstruction 
and the second reconstruction and also BLM and give props to the stories of um, black women, you know? So I, I really wanted to, and I've been in a black feminist space for decades, but this was the first book that I was able to really flex those muscles and just 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 put it out there in in that way. And what is it what does it mean to sort of look at American democracy through the eyes of Audre Lorde or Angela Davis or uh, you know um, Tamika Mallory or Alicia Garza or Ida B. Wells and 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 then after not only what does it mean um, you know what can we learn you know what can we learn you know in terms of uh, and that's why I say co-architects, because I think Black men are architects of American democracy, too. I think at times, because of patriarchy, during especially these first two periods of Reconstruction, um, they were uh, effacing and erasing um, the leadership of Black women, and the, 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 not just the contributions of Black women, but sort of these theoretical interventions of Black women. And we need to sort of wrestle with that. And I think the third reconstruction has been really interesting because by saying all Black lives matter, we've all been forced to wrestle with our own humanity. And I think that's really important. Obviously, for some, it's too, too high of a mountain to climb and they, they drift back into just reaction, right? Violence, um, they want to kill Black people. Um, and even within the Black community, some drift into reaction and say, well, what do they want? Um, why are we talking about trans folks? Why are we talking about poor folks? Why are we talking about the disabled? Um, uh, why are we talking about black women? Um, but at the same time, it's had a real optimistic, hopeful outcome where so many people have embraced this and said, okay, yes, you know, black women are leaders and 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 black feminism can really help us transform the situation we're in. Um, and, and intersectional justice is something that's really important and we can learn from, and here's how it can actually be applied. So I think that the stories we tell are so important. And, you know, I'll, I'll finally, I'll, I'll say that what was so interesting during this period was um, Nicole Hannah-Jones and the 1619 Project, but also the popularization of the theoretical work of Kimberly Crenshaw, the popularization of the work of Barbara Smith and the Conby River Collective, the popularization of um, the work of Audre Lorde, but Fran Beale, Gwen Patton, um, Third World Women's Alliance, right? Uh, kitchen Table uh, Sink Press, right? Uh, this Bridge Call My Back, and you know, but some of us are brave, right? These sort of foundational uh, 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 text in Black feminist studies and Black women's studies. Uh, became operationalized. And I try to talk about that in the book, right? And, and, you know, obviously I'm building on the work of Barbara Ransby and Bell Hooks and all these different folks, but try to talk about, hey, Kathy Cohen's and AIDS and Beth Ritchie and Black women and domestic violence. And what does that mean and how they provided sinecures for what was to come, right? Um, and, and they were doing work uh, in the context of Reagan and Bush, where you you weren't getting 25 million people out in the streets, right? But it still matters, right? And so I wanted those stories to be shared and looked upon as sort of the bone and sinew. And in the earlier iteration is the Fannie Lou Hamer and the, the Ella Bakers, and yes, the Black Panthers, but there were more Black women in the Black Panthers than men, right? So Kathleen Cleaver and, and you know Elaine Brown and, and so many others. So I was trying to sort of share those stories both both alongside of my own story and how 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 finding out about those stories really helped shape me and my own story, which is why I think education is so important. And I understand, obviously I disagree with it, why the critical race theory hoax, because I do think if you've got these stories into every K through 12 public school in the country, it would have an impact and reverberations. It doesn't mean all our problems are solved, Betsy, but it would have an impact. And the reason why you have the CRT hoax is to stop it and stop because the story spread like wildfire in 2020 in a way that it never had. We had so many black women and black people on bestsellers lists, you know, and people weren't just buying them by the tens of thousands. They were buying them by the hundreds of thousands and some, you know, how to be an anti-racist and such sold, you know, millions. So yeah, it's a very important story. Yeah. So there are two things there that you said that I wanted to follow up on. So one, I do want to hear more about the role of Black women in this in this book and about, 
you, you know, you talk about Sonia Sanchez and how she shaped your thinking. So I, I definitely want to hear more about that. But I also want to follow up on your discussion of stories, right? So you started out talking about, you know, your story and, you know, how and why that sort of functions in the book. Um, but it's, you know, the theme of story is an important one in this book. You talk about the lost cause narrative. You talk about the backlash against critical race theory. Um, so there, you know, there, there, there's a conservative story here that you're, you know, you're telling a counter narrative. And I wonder if you could talk about, you know, why story is so important to how we think about history, you know, how it shapes our policy, um, et cetera. No, no, great. Thank you, Betsy. I, you know, I think stories, one of the things that we don't understand about stories is that, and I think, you know, Betsy, in terms of where historians and and um, uh, Africans know this and folks from the Caribbean know this, oral traditions are actually more important than written traditions. Mm -hmm. And the reason why orality is more important is that orality is more connected to the here and now and how you're actually treating each other than the written word. So you can have a declaration of independence and have racial slavery. You can have a constitution and women can't vote. You can have all these lofty words and there's Native American dispossession and there's all this, 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 this violence happening, right? But when you tell yourself um, a story, if the society is telling themselves a story uh, that's as complex as its reality, it's going to shape that reality in much different ways. So for example, we can tell ourselves a story of why people, everybody deserves um, a guaranteed income, a guaranteed living wage. Or we can tell ourselves a story about why there are makers and takers and most people don't deserve anything. And people who have the most should have the most forever and ever. Whichever story we choose to tell as a society, what we don't understand, especially Americans, especially the West, is that in telling ourselves that story, whether we tell ourselves that over the radio or in newspapers or in books or in public speeches, we actually are going to fulfill the story we tell, right? We're going to, the, the reason why John F. Kennedy does the American University speech June 10th, 1963, and he calls for the end of nuclear proliferation, mm -hmm. he starts to realize that ever since he became president, he'd been talking about war and fear uh, and anxiety with the Soviets. And we had the Cuban Missile Crisis, we had all these different things, and we were actually creating the Armageddon that we were talking about. And so he tries to pull, he tries to pull it back and say, hey, what if we try to tell ourselves a story of nuclear deterrent, right? It doesn't mean that it's perfect what happens after, but we don't blow up the world where he understood that, look, he had contributed to that story. You know, he was one of the main proselytizers of a certain story that was going to lead to World War III, right? And it's the same thing for us. I mean, we can tell ourselves a story of, of, uh, of mass incarceration and why it's justified. We can tell ourselves a story of why, you know, Black women uh, don't deserve to have the same wealth as white women and the same degrees and the same homes, right? Once we tell ourselves that story, that's the reality that we create. So stories are hugely, hugely important and they're connected to all of us. It's connected to immigration, it's connected to wealth, it's connected to environmental justice. When we tell a story of environmental justice that just centers white people, that just centers uh, white folks and white communities, guess who we forget about in that story? We forget about communities of color who are most disproportionately impacted by climate injustice, right? So the only way to get them in on any kind of policy protections we can see this uh, with what we've done with Jackson, Mississippi. We say folks in Jackson are worthless so they can have brown water. And we have a white uh, governor who straight out of central casting, white supremacist Confederate central casting from the 19th century, who's laughing at this, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think stories are really, really important. And I think the stories we tell, Betsy, we can't just paint a pretty picture because I think Barack Obama, one of the things I write about and you know from reading the book, I get deep into Obama and deep into Black Lives Matter. And I have great admiration for M M Barack and Michelle Obama, and it comes through. And I'm also critical of, of Barack Obama. Uh, uh, and, and 
the story he tells about America in 2004 and in 2007, 2008, it's a beautiful story of American exceptionalism. Uh, we're constantly trying to perfect the union. The underside of that story, which he doesn't want us to struggle with, but which we need to struggle with, um, is, is, is all of the racism and injustice that is sewn into the fabric of American society and American democracy and American exceptionalism. And the thing is, Obama is our, our, um, our proof positive. He's our proof that, because for eight years, for the most part, he shies away from talking about those injustices and racism. And what we get is Donald Trump. So not talking about it doesn't make those issues go away, right? The only way we can get to reproductive justice in this country, especially after Dobbs, is by talking about reproductive injustice and what's happening to women in the country. We can't, we can't get justice for them by saying, let's, let's not talk about it because we're going to piss people off. Right? Right? That's the only way. But that I, I thought that Obama told a great story, but again, a lot of it, it 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 wasn't true. It wasn't true, right? And then after a while, the lie caught up with all of us, right? Because American exceptionalism is based on two big lies that I talk about. The first lie is is that black people aren't human beings, right? And that's where you get the dignity gap, the value gap, the citizenship gap. And the only reason why, uh, that had to be the foundation of American exceptionalism is that the dehumanization of Black folks allows racial slavery to thrive. And as we've seen, you know, Harvard, Georgetown, all these universities are now doing reckonings. But it wasn't just the wealth we produced. Uh, and we see those books, uh, Empire of Cotton or Black Reconstruction or Sadia Hartman's work or so, so many others. It's that we were actually financialized black bodies. We were financialized. We were leverage and collateral that people used to build all of this, including Amherst, University of Texas, where I'm at, the whole gambit. That's what I'm saying. Reparations is never going to be enough for what happened to us. That's what I'm saying, right? Obama doesn't want to talk about this, but that's the lie American exceptionalism is built on, that we were considered a species of property that could be killed and murdered and raped and maimed, but also financialized like mortgage securities to give generational wealth transfers to white folks for the end of, till the end of all time. And those generational wealth transfers continue in football, in finance, in higher ed. It continues as we speak right now. Right. Even as there's some of us who are investigating this, we're social scientists and we're like, OK, where does where does uh, Lehman Brothers come in here? And where does where does this railroad come in here? Right. We're not going to get the money back unless there's some kind of revolution. But we're seeing that here's the supply chains of what they did to us. Right. Um, when we think about the second big lie American exceptionalism is based on, it's really in the 20th century and the 21st century is the idea that the first lie did not happen. So they preach to you colorblindness and they keep lying and lying about the reality that we're in. So the first lie is that we are non-humans. And then the second lie is that the first thing never happened to us. And why are you talking about slavery? And my ancestors don't owe you anything because I came from Germany or Lithuania or, or Australia or whatever. And, and without acknowledging that you come into this racial caste system that's based on black denigration and subordination. So everything you've done and all the access you've had is based on that first lie and that original sin of racial slavery, right? Obama didn't wanna to touch this. Not only did he not wanna to touch it, and I write about this in the book, Betsy, he gets into the March 18th, 2008 race speech where he makes white grievance against affirmative action the moral equivalent of white racial slavery. And everybody gives him a standing ovation and he becomes president of the United States. Yeah, no, um, I, I really like the way you talk about Obama and the story that he tells and particularly his, his personal story that it's a story of possibility for all Americans when, as you point out in the book, for many people, it just isn't possible to have a trajectory like no. this. Yeah, we're not getting to Occidental. We're not getting to Columbia. We damn sure ain't getting to Harvard Law. <laughs> Come on. You know, I mean, he's an outlier. Michelle, Princeton, 
Harvard, this is great stuff. And you want to say, hey, we're happy for their achievements. But th these are outliers. I think what's interesting about the Obamas is that from 1963 to 2013, there is, I argue, a 50-year racial, racial justice consensus that's not perfect, but it really is the biggest racial justice consensus we've ever had from John F. Kennedy's June 11th speech all the way to the June 25th Shelby v. Holder uh, Supreme Court decision, basically ending the Voting Rights Act. That 50-year period gives you the most access for women, uh, people of color uh, in American history, uh, in, in finance, in politics, uh, in terms of racial integration, in terms of amassing wealth and being able to head corporations uh, that 50 year period. Uh, the backlash against that is what we're experiencing and what we're in now, right? So even as we have, like I said, first black Harvard president, which comes, um, she's gonna start in 2023. So that comes actually, um, it's gonna be almost 14 years after the first black president, right? Harvard took over a decade, maybe almost a decade and a half to get, you know, I think it's great that it's a, a, a black woman. I think it's great that she's of Haitian descent. I think all that is great, but we're in a real reaction against that period of 63 to, to 2013. And even Hillary Clinton's loss in 2016 is really based on the algorithms that Shelby sets up and that it, undo, and it undoes because, Obama got elected twice with 43 and then 39 percent of the white vote. Um, and by 2012, for the first and only time in American history, 66 percent of black eligible voters voted compared to 64 percent of white eligible voters. They beat us in the aggregate, but it's the first and only federal election in American history, in the history of the republic, where there was larger black voter turnout than white voter turnout by percentage, right? Within less than a year, John Roberts changes that, right? So we have to understand the connection with that and reconstruction and white supremacy and the lost cause, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're, we're caught up in, in a real existential uh, narrative war uh, for, you know, over the future of American democracy. But what we have to stop doing, and I think it's, it's not just redemptionist, but it's reconstructionist too. We have to stop lying about the state of the country and the history of the country, right? So we've got to, and Dr. King, I think he says it beautifully, April 4th, 1967, the Riverside Church speech, where he says that he loves the country, but he's going to criticize the country, uh, uh, talks about the Vietnam War, um, uh, militarism, racism, materialism, but he says it's going to be a bitter but beautiful struggle. And that's when we talk about narratives, we have to tell the bitter but beautiful struggle um, that we're engaged in, right? And we can say we love the country as well because of Fannie Lou Hamer and Ella Baker and Ida B. Wells, not because of some uh, uh, American exceptionalist myth of patriotism and a myth of the founding fathers uh, and, and, and myths about what happened with um, settler colonialism and, and so much more, but because of the people who struggled to bring about multiracial democracy. And those are the real heroes of the, our story. That, that, and, and again, the sickness of our country is that instead of having monuments to Ella Baker and Ida B. Wells, we have monuments to Robert E. Lee and monuments to people who committed uh, mass murder uh, really on a genocidal scale. They, that's what they were doing because we, we, we keep saying we know how many people died during the transatlantic slave trade. That's not true. That's not true. You know, that's not true. Whatever numbers they're giving us um, are, are, are lower because it's black people we're talking about and African people we're talking about. We don't know how many uh, black women were murdered during the, 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 during racial slavery. We don't know how many black babies were murdered during this time period. All of that is a lie because we don't have records. They didn't keep records, right? So, so we're, we're, we're forced to be the ancestors who are literally uh, picking up uh, uh, bones, right, from the archaeological grounds to find out, remember the burial ground in New York, and they were going to build a, another bank or something on it, and then we found out it was an African burial ground, and we, 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 we did something for that. But we, we still don't know the extent of the violence and the terror that has been um, um, unleashed against us. And even through that violence and terror, we've been able, uh, like a concrete uh, rose, a rose among the concrete to really rise and flourish uh, in, in context, right? So it's important to be able to tell both sides of those stories. And Betsy, if we do that, 
our story connects with the story of, of Native Americans and we've seen um, Taya Miles and we've seen, you know, we, we connect with Asian American Pacific Islanders. Um, our story, and it's interesting, I saw Wakanda Forever, uh, the black, brown, both conflicts and alliances, they want the same thing, safety, uh, Talokan and Wakanda, but but they go to war initially. So the 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 both coalitions and the conflicts we've had with our Latinx uh, sisters and brothers, um, um, white ones as well. We can tell the story of the whole country uh, in a multiracial and a beautifully expansive way. Uh, but we've been disallowed from doing that because um, this country is hell bent on um, protecting the lie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I wonder if before we can turn to the audience's question, question, sorry, if we can kind of talk about what gives you hope. So you have chapters on dignity and citizenship. I wonder if you can point to some examples of things that give you hope for the future within these themes, particularly of Black dignity and citizenship. Because it is an optimistic book, right? I mean, you're saying oh, yeah. that you, you think there's great potential in this third reconstruction for change. Oh, absolutely. And I think, you know, dignity and citizenship are great um, because I use those as concepts. And, um, you know, I argue that dignity is what we're all born with. You know, we have God-given dignity. And I think that, um, uh, you know, at the lower frequencies, Black radicals have always held on to their own understanding and acknowledgement that they matter, uh, whereas citizenship is the external recognition of our dignity. And we need that to live in a society. But I think Black radicals, uh, whether you're thinking about Malcolm X or Angela Davis, you think dignity is hugely, hugely important. And I think Black Lives Matter really combined dignity and citizenship, where they really believed in this idea of Black dignity and that uh, there was no value gap between Black people and other, other people. And that's a really incredibly important concept because some people are born and their own parents don't acknowledge or revere their dignity, you know, for whatever reason, right? So really holding on to your own human dignity, that I think is central for all of us, our self-love. Before we can love other people, we have to love ourselves. We have to understand that we have value. Um, and we're, for Black people, it's very, very difficult because you're born into a world where you're getting these constant messages um, of devaluation and of subjugation, right? So we, we, we understand that. Uh, citizenship is important because um, you do need external, um, um, I don't, I don't want to say you do need, but the external validation of your dignity provides you different layers of safety. That's what I would say. That's what it does. Because those of us who don't have passports, and if you're not an American citizen, you still have value because of dignity. And that's why we should be in solidarity with folks who are uh, in detention camps in the United States and all over the world, those who are incarcerated should still be allowed to vote because of their human dignity. That's what we're saying, right? And we really should be interested in the abolishment of, of all forms of prison and indignity that, that, that exist. And so I think when you think about dignity and citizenship, I think it's hugely important. And I think this goes back to your question about Sonia Sanchez. I think learning about Black women and sort of the history of Black feminism, the Black arts movement, but also Sonia's own story, Birmingham, Harlem, um, um, you know, uh, San Francisco State, uh, Amherst, uh, becoming Temple University, becoming this, this Black arts uh, icon, social justice icon, human rights icon, uh, feminist icon was really, really important, profoundly important to me and helped me to better understand sort of the um, the, the, both the value of dignity and citizenship, but also the differences too, right? Because we always have to remember we have dignity and yes, we want some kind of citizenship and external recognition because we need that because we have a society with law enforcement and military and, and different institutions. But we have to remember that the ball game is um, our dignity and that we all have it. And I think that that's where BLM has been really unbelievably profound. And this is where the work of, you know, Tamika Mallory and Alicia Garza and, and you know, Patrice Cullors, Opal Tibetti, uh, Brittany Packnett, um, so many others that we can read. I, I encourage everybody to read The Purpose of Our Power by Alicia Garza. But Mariam Kaba, uh, we do this till we set ourselves, uh, till we free ourselves. 
the idea of hope is a discipline, really important because they told us a different story, this idea of all Black lives mattering. You know, I write in the book about the June uh, 2020 um, Black Trans Lives Matter March and why that was so important as this, this movement of deep democracy in the country because we've been, um, uh, we, we've had our own problems within the Black community, Betsy. We've had deep patriarchy and sexism, misogyny, homophobia, transphobia. I don't think we have had that uh, in greater proportion than other <laughs> parts of society. I think we're just a part of the society. And to see a beautiful march like that, where um, folks got together who were straight, who were queer, who were, who were um, you know, everything under the sun and, and acknowledged the value of, 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 of trans women were, were really, uh, you know, hugely important. And I think those things give me give me hope, you know, the hope is less than sort of the corporate acknowledgement of Black Lives Matter. Um, and I write about Ross, Roger Goodell in the hostage video, he said, Black Lives Matter, you know, in 2020, the whole world's exploding. And he was like in a bunker saying Black Lives Matter, eyes bugging out, thinking the Black Panthers are right outside, the revolution's coming, <laughs> revolution's coming, you know, Gil Scott Heron uh, saying the revolution will not be televised. It was, it's really more in the grassroots and sort of the bottom up transformations that we've seen where people are talking about public safety in a different way, are talking about redistributive justice, which is what we need. Um, I do find hope, you know, in that, you know, so I think that there's aspects that the Black Lives Matter policy agenda has been very, very hopeful and is a radical policy agenda about redistributive justice when it comes to wealth, when it comes to safety, when it comes to environmental justice, when it comes to K through 12 education, when it comes to not punishing Black kids uh, in classrooms, uh, when it comes to so much more. So I do think there's there's deep hope. And, um, you know, it's not the triumph, it's the struggle. You know, we, we have to find hope uh, in, in struggling. Mariam Kaba says hope is a discipline. I agree. And it's really about uh, the struggle. And the more you're in the struggle, um, the more hopeful you are. I think a lot of people who lose hope um, are, are sort of disconnected to communities of struggle. And that could be, those communities might be your, 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 the, your, the school your kids go to. It might be a community center. It might be the church you're going to. It might be something secular or sectarian, but as long as you're engaged in something um, that goes beyond the vote, voting is very important, but voting is just the tip of the sphere uh, for us as citizens, right? Um, and as just as human beings. So I do think, I, I definitely find a lot of hope in what's occurred, even as I'm aware of the backlash that is occurring simultaneously. Right, that's great. Um, well, turning to the questions in the Q&A, it looks like actually the second question was about hope for the future, so that's great. And then the first question, um, I'll read that, but just wanted to encourage folks to, um, to go ahead and put any additional questions there in the Q&A. Um, but so this first question is, um, is there a role for whites in the BLM movement and the third reconstruction? Yeah, you know, I think, um, you know, I, I grew up in a, in a labor household, union household, and I think there is um, roles for white folks uh, who, who are standing in solidarity with this idea of uh, multiracial democracy. So there were reconstructionists in the 19th century. Thaddeus Stevens is one of our most famous, right? But really in a lot of ways, um, uh, white reconstructionists faltered, you know, um, they weren't willing to fight alongside black people for black dignity and citizenship. I think during the second reconstruction, uh, we do have whites who stand in solidarity for a time. You think about Mississippi Freedom Summer, uh, you think about some um, aspects of uh, civil rights uh, marches and demonstrations and organizations. Um, but then a lot of them go and connect with the anti-war movement, right? I think during this third period of Reconstruction, we did see, um, and we know this to be demonstrably true, uh, during the summer, spring and summer of 2020, the largest numbers of whites uh, in American history who actively demonstrated, period, let alone they were demonstrating Black Lives Matter, right? So that that's that's really important. But then it becomes what is the what is the work uh, we're going to do? And I think what what white uh, folks can do that goes way beyond allyship is to stand in solidarity 
But I think as you've seen, like if you look at the data, Betsy, from the 2022 midterms, um, almost six in 10 white voters voted for the Republican Party. Um, and the Republican Party at this point in our history is a redemptionist party. That's obvious. And, and anybody who wants to argue that point, um, it's at this point. Uh, it's ridiculous. So it's a redemptionist party. And so that 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 should sober all of us. And I think the other groups that vote for um, the Democrats, which is the Reconstructionist Party, however imperfect, um, a lot of times are afraid and anxious. And, and so if, 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 if white folks are afraid and anxious to talk about the depth and breadth of white supremacy and the lost cause and the redemptionist narrative, how must Black folks and other people of color feel, right? That's the whole thing. So it's a scary thing to confront, right? And I think some of them are confronting it in their own families and families that are split between MAGA and non-MAGA, um, um, you know, Trump, DeSantis. Um, so, you know, I, what I think is that, yes, they can play a big vital role, but that role is dependent upon um, being courageous enough not only to speak truth to power, but to do something impactful uh, in circles and sectors of society that a lot of time uh, they would have much more impact than than a Black person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so here's a question. Um, do you agree whenever Blacks have made gains, there's a bigger backlash afterwards? Thanks. You know, I think, it, you know, it depends. I mean, there's, you know, I'd say on some levels, yes, there's always a backlash. But I think when we look at the second reconstruction, um, despite the backlash after the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act, and certainly you can say, look, the backlash creates the prison industrial complex, uh, 2 million people in prison, and I would not disagree. Um, but for a time, it, it does appear as if, um, even as the late 70s, Black uh, white enrollment is very, very close um, in terms of colleges and universities and higher education. Uh, but at the same time, you get a disinvestment in, um, um, you know, in public colleges and public universities, right? Um, there's great work on cars and racism uh, by the, the NYU professors, which looks at cars and uh, automobile loans and how people who are recently incarcerated have a much better chance of getting uh, t terrible loans for like a luxury car that's used than for a sensible car because uh, it's connected to um, basically financial shakedowns that happen against poor people. And uh, there's policing that is just a shakedown against poor people. We've seen this in the Justice Department's uh, Ferguson report, right? And what they did against Black people was just raise a couple of million dollars a year in taxes through a shakedown of fines and fees. And they do that to poor Black motorists nationally. So yeah, I mean, built into just the country is this backlash, right? That, and that's what we talk about, like systemic racism, right? And structural racism. So I would agree that there is that uh, but I would also say that we 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 could potentially um, dismantle those things. You know, even things like the legalization of marijuana, um, which I support, or at least its decriminalization, is really important there. So there's a lot that we could do um, to dismantle um, these systems um, and really set up a future where we're not thinking about. We're not thinking about backlash because the politics of punishment and anti-Blackness are not um, the central organizing principles of the entire country. That's a future, that's a distant future because right now um, they really are, uh, in spite of, again, these, these uh, progressive um, racial firsts that we're seeing, whether it's Obama or uh, uh, what's happened with, with, with Harvard and President-elect President Gay, or Kamala Harris um, um, baked into this system is um, redistributive injustice. You know? So basically the way in which our system works globally, but certainly American history is that um, blackness and black people are utilized for extractive um, policies, right? And sometimes people call it extractive uh, capitalism but that's how it works here. So black folks, even 
even when they're successful, they're being used to um, extract resources that flow upward, that flow upward. Um, uh, you know, political, economic, social uh, resources. Um, and, and we should want to change that, but that's going to be a very, very difficult thing to change because the whole country is built around that organizing principle. Mm -hmm. That's why. And that's why you don't see, you know, 32 Black owners of the NFL. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that Black folks are, the, are running the biggest hedge funds and private equity firms in the world. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's what it's not because they're not talented enough. It's not because they don't want to make any money. Okay. It's because there's, there's a different set of um, uh, uh, machinery working that it's hard to disentangle from. Yeah. Right. Um, all right. Here's another question. Can you talk about the differences between how Black women and Black men organize and take action and whether or how that's changed in the last 100 to 150 years? Yeah, you know, I mean, it has changed because, you know, when you think about the first and second reconstructions, Black women are organizing politically always, but they're because the first reconstruction all the way up until 1965, they can't vote in large numbers. Um, some are voting after 1920 in some of the states that are outside the South where Black people live the most, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Illinois, New Jersey, New York, but for the most part, you don't see a lot of Black women voting, let alone being able to get elected to office until post-65. Um, so they're organizing in churches, they're organizing in civic and social spaces, they're organizing mutual aid clubs and societies, they're organizing literary gatherings, they're organizing um, as progressives to stop that era's mass incarceration. They're doing anti-poverty organizing. So they're doing a whole lot. I mean, they're connected to the Harlem Renaissance and the Chicago Renaissance. But even before that, they're connected to um, movements that are trying to build up Black churches, schools, historically Black colleges and universities, uh, different women's club, a Black club women's movement uh, from the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. So they're doing tremendous organizing. In a lot of ways, um, they've always clearly been uh, the organizers within the community. They're, 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 they're organizing Black men who can vote to vote. Uh, they're organizing literacy campaigns. They're organizing anti-poverty campaigns. They're organizing um, churches and other groups uh, to talk about specific issues related to Black citizenship and dignity. So like I said, in a way, if you really look at it through, there's a clear through line from, from the first reconstruction to now, which is like a, I'm going to be 160 years in 2025 of sort of Black women organizing. I think that Black men's organizing during that same period um, takes on the parallel role of, of um, you know, what, what white patriarchs were doing, where a lot of times Black men were, were out in front of an organization, uh, even as it's Black women who are doing the day-to-day -day, um, work uh, the quotidian work that allows that organization to function and give it form and substance and bone and sinew, right? Um, so in a lot of ways, I think what's what's happened, at least during the third reconstruction, is that a, a lot of times Black women are are continuing to organize, but, but in a very, very public way, um, receiving benefits and credit of that organization. So you know, we know, hey, it's Stacey Abrams, and we acknowledge Stacey Abrams gives us uh, these two male senators, one Black, one Jewish, right? Uh, it's her work. And of course, there's thousands of other people organizing, including Black men who are organizing alongside of her, but she's the main strategist for this. So I think what we've seen in our time period, which is different, is Black women um, being the public face of, of of movements for radical democracy and movements for black citizenship and dignity. And, you know, and I think this is a good thing. So I think some people are um, scared and anxious about it. I think it's a good thing because the word I use is, I think black men and women are co-architects of this idea of reimagining American democracy. So I think we need each other. I think we have to stand alongside of each other, but that's what I say, it's co-architects. So that means sometimes 
um, she leads, and sometimes you're 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 right alongside or right right in the back right there, and then and then and then it can be vice versa. But there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, you know, say me and Betsy are doing this organization. We say Betsy's the face of the organization. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, I mean, that's a good thing. That's not that's not. Um, oh my gosh, these black men are being emasculated and there's a conspiracy. It's a conspiracy. Um, it's really not like you, you can, you can be right there, uh, in the room, um, and say, Hey, I'm so proud of Stacey Abrams. I'm proud of, 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 of Betsy. I'm proud of Claudine Gay. I feel good and feel that we're making progress. It's not about, um, freedom is not, um, a patriarchal design and freedom doesn't have a, a, a man's face on it. Even though more men have been on um, currency and legal tender than women, because it's something called patriarchy. <laughs> right. you know, that, that's why it's not that men are, they're just so handsome. They're just so bright. They're so, he's, he's, he's so bright. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> you know, um, so yeah. <laughs> well, so I, I think we're at time here. I will say there's quite an interesting question about Clarence Thomas in the chat. So I'm sorry to miss out on hearing your thoughts on Clarence Thomas. We'll have to hear that Ooh. next time. But yeah. it's been a really illuminating um, discussion. Thank you so much for your work, Peniel. And oh, Omar, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Betsy. It was a great conversation. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, this was a really awesome conversation. I couldn't you know, expect anything else from Peniel. Thank you so much um, Thank you. for your electrifying words. And thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, I really appreciate um, you acting as moderator. Um, so I'm going to drop a few links in the chat. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, there's a link to Peniel's book. Um, there's also a link to our YouTube channel. I'm going to upload this uh, webinar tomorrow morning, um, so you can rewatch it or share it with the uh, uh, people. Um, uh, who uh, who you love or don't love, you know, they, they all need to hear this. <laughs> um, and then um, also a link to our upcoming events. Um, we have uh, Clemens Conversation on December 19th and an author program on December 20th. We're going to take a little break for the holidays um, and then we'll be back um, next year with a whole slate of stuff um, I haven't put it up on on the website for the most part, but it'll 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 be getting on there in the next uh, week or so. Um, so yes, thank you so much for joining us this evening, um, and please join us again. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you.